We've got some great, absolutely wonderful speakers this morning, and we're going to start with a very unusual speaker. Firstly, he's a Stanford professor. That's already unusual, because how many of those are there in the world? Number two, he's a physicist. How many Stanford professors who are physicists? How many? Uh, about 40. 40. So he's, he's in the top 40 of Stanford physicists. Uh, and then um, thirdly, he's very, very involved in blockchain. I think there's only one of those. <laughs> so he's number one. So if we can, uh, if we can um, ask uh, Sucheng Zhang to come up, and my pronunciation probably destroyed his name. Um, and he's going to be our kickoff speaker, and he's going to be very interesting. So I'll be back later. Good morning. So today I'd like to uh, share with you uh, some of my thoughts uh, about uh, foundations of uh, crypto economic science. Uh, also share about, uh, with you my thoughts about where the field is going. And to get, uh, together, uh, perhaps we can build a really uh, exciting future. So today, uh, blockchain is such a new thing. And everybody tries to speculate about the future of the uh, blockchain. Uh, I think it's really, really uh, disruptive, but uh, to uh, really uh, try to understand and to appreciate its value, uh, I'd like to address the question, what is the intrinsic value? Uh, and what is the intrinsic value of a medium of exchange? Uh, just uh, like you heard from the introduction, I'm a physicist, and it's quite unusual for a physicist to, to think about blockchain. But I find some uh, examples of uh, analogy uh, quite useful. And the key concept uh, we're all discussing today is about the concept of medium of exchange. So uh, how did this concept arise, for example, uh, in monetary economy, but also address the question, how does this uh, concept arise in uh, physics, for example? So uh, let's give a very simple example. Uh, uh, even though I know many of you may not be physicists, but you all have learned high school physics. So in high school physics, you talk about charges, and they have interactions with each other. Pairwise, if I have n charges, I have certain pairwise interactions between the charges. But they also interact at very long-ranged uh, interaction. So later, people find this description uh, of interaction between charges rather inconvenient. And they introduce a concept uh, exactly called the medium of exchange, which is electric field. So first, people find very strange that uh, two charges far distance away can interact with each other. So therefore, they introduce the concept of a field. So you say the charge induces a field, and then the field acts on the other charges. So that uh, way, the concept of the medium of exchange is uh, born. So uh, actually, when you see the analogy with monetary economy, is quite precise. In the very early days, the economic interchange, exchange is based on barter economy. So people change goods, one kind of good for another kind of good. For example, my fish with your apple. Uh, but this uh, economy is very inefficient, just like describing the interaction among the charges using long-range interaction. Pairwise long-range interaction is very uh, inconvenient because it requires a double coincidence of wants. So in order for this exchange to take place, I have to happen to want your apple, you have to happen to want my uh, fish. And that probability is very low. So people later introduced the concept of monetary economy as a medium of exchange. So we exchange our goods for money and then money into other kind of goods. So you see the analogy is very, very uh, precise, that uh, we have uh, interaction between charges. First, the charge uh, uh, generates the medium of exchange, which is electric field. And that electric field further acts on the other charge. But very early on, people still thought this is some auxiliary description of uh, something which can be described otherwise, and they don't assign an intrinsic value to the concept of electric field. Uh, that actually changed uh, much later, and uh, one of the greatest scientific revolution is to understand that the medium of exchange has intrinsic value. And actually, Albert Einstein's Nobel Prize is not for relativity, but for assigning a value to the electric field. Uh, namely, uh, the universal value in the natural world is energy. So his uh, formula for which he won the Nobel Prize assigns the uh, energy to the uh, electric field. So uh, today we talk about uh, uh, monetary economy as a medium of exchange. And uh, actually, the whole point about blockchain 
is to discuss what kind of new forms of money uh, there is uh, possible. So in order to address this question, we first need to understand uh, what is kind of the intrinsic value of money. So we can, for example, compare two medium of exchange, uh, which uh, happened quite early on in the monetary economy. You can either have something that has commodity value, such as Apple, or something that doesn't have that much commodity value, uh, such as uh, gold uh, itself. So why is gold more suitable as a medium of exchange rather than uh, Apple? And that difference lies if we, uh, of course, Apple has some commodity value, you can eat it. So it looks like more natural to have Apple uh, as medium of exchange. But they have a key difference. Because by saying one Apple, we understand very different things. So the consensus about one Apple is very, very broad. Different people assign very different values to what is meant by one Apple. Whereas by one ounce of gold, we know precisely what it means. So actually, when you really think about the key about the uh, uh, monetary, the exchange value of, uh, of the medium of exchange uh, lies its in uh, consensus. So why do we have better consensus uh, for gold rather than apple? So I was, I was very happy to uh, find out that, uh, uh, that Keith, who introduced me, founded the Archimedes Lab. So actually, two great physicists made important contributions in making gold the gold standard, as we knew before. First, you all know about the story of Archimedes. Uh, the king gave him a very difficult task. The king has a crown, and he needs to figure out whether the crown is made out of pure gold without destroying the crown. And Archimedes thought and thought and thought. He couldn't figure that out either. And uh, in desperation, he took a bath. And as he was floating in the bathtub, he suddenly had a eureka moment. He figured out that without destroying the crown, he can uh, determine whether the crown is made out of pure gold or not, uh, simply by weighing uh, two things in air and then weighing the same thing uh, in water. And they were, <laughs> if the gold is not made of, if the crown is not made out of pure gold, you will see the difference. So this gives rise to the consensus of gold. By one ounce of gold, we know precisely uh, what is uh, meant by one ounce of gold, even though you don't uh, exactly need to look into the interior compositions. So later, people started using gold coins. But as the gold coin was circulating in the economy, uh, another problem arose because uh, people tried to cheat. They tried to rub off the gold coin a little bit. And if you rub off enough, you get uh, one extra gold coin. So therefore, the concept of one gold coin lost its consensus meaning because it could be one gold coin that has not been rubbed off or another gold coin that has been rubbed off. So you all know Isaac Newton was a great uh, physicist, made great contributions to our understanding of nature. But after he became famous, uh, Queen Anne of uh, England gave him a glorious job. He became the master of the royal mint. It was his job to control uh, the consensus of one gold coin. And it was he, Isaac Newton, who invented this idea to cut these edges, uh, to cut these rings around the edges of the uh, coin so that if you rub it off, you will immediately tell. So all this contributed to giving precise consensus about what is meant by one uh, gold coin and what is meant by one ounce of gold. So now, uh, when we talk about monetary economy, therefore, it's very, very important to reach consensus. And today, actually, uh, besides blockchain, one another word that's commonly used in connection to crypto economics and uh, to blockchain is the idea of consensus. So people realize, in order for a monetary exchange uh, to take place, the most important concept is to have consensus. In particular, consensus about the temporal order of the transactions. Now, how is this possible? Previously, it was only possible with some centralized <coughs> controlled entity. Uh, people didn't realize that it's possible to have consensus in a decentralized world. But when you actually look into the physical world, there are examples like this all over the place. For example, every day in the morning when you try to stick a piece of magnet onto your refrigerator, something magic is happening. Uh, in fact, everything is in some sense magnetic because the electron, everything is made out of electron, is like a little magnetic compass. But most of the time, they all point in some random directions. So most of the time, they don't, don't reach consensus. But in some special circumstances, they all reach consensus and they all decide to point in one direction. And therefore, the magnet can stick on top of your refrigerator. But the natural world left, to, left onto itself naturally tends to be more disordered rather than ordered. Consensus is very rare 
uh, disorder is uh, much more frequent. So therefore, physicists formulated a fundamental law of nature about the fact that the entropy always increases. The natural world naturally tends to be more disordered and no consensus. So if you want to reach consensus, in some way you have to counteract this natural force. And the only way to do it is to make yourself more ordered, reducing entropy, and dump the entropy uh, extra into the rest of the world. Uh, this happens in the physical world, as in the example of the magnet, reaching consensus naturally uh, in a self-organized, uh, decentralized, distributed way, but by dumping entropy somewhere else. It also occurs in biological world through a wonderful mechanism, for example, called quorum sensing. So if you have a lot of bacteria, they can collectively decide and reach a consensus to do something, for example, flash up. Uh, in some way. So for example, there's a bacteria called bacteria fisheri, and they all emit some uh, receptors to their surrounding. And if one bacteria detects enough receptors, he will know enough uh, other bacteria are around it, and they can collectively decide to flash up, therefore reaching consensus about one collective action in a de decentralized uh, way. So people in computer science have thought long and deep about this uh, problem, that if I ha have a system of distributed computers, and if I want to maintain something like a common database, if I want to conduct something like monetary economy by agreeing on a temporal order globally uh, of uh, transactions, how can we do that? The first idea is trying to find some centralized master some master deterministic algorithm where it can tell all the computers and has some master intelligence and can tell all the computers what to do and thereby reaching consensus. People tried and tried and tried and eventually they find this is not possible. Actually, they can actually prove that this is not possible and this is the famous Fisher-Lynch-Patterson theorem which says that it's not possible to design a master deterministic algorithm to reach consensus in a distributed system. So this is a very analogous to a phenomenon that happens in physics, because I said the natural world naturally tends to be disordered, and there cannot be some kind of centralized intelligence. And so we actually have a funny name for it. It's called the Maxwell's demon. It's not possible to have such thing as a centralized demon telling all the physical world, uh, sensing all the physical world uh, what to do. So therefore, blockchain uh, really becomes compatible with this idea not to have a centralized master algorithm uh, in a, operating in a deterministic way, but have a decentralized consensus mechanism based on proof of work. So what is the key idea behind proof of work when you really think about the, the very fundamental basics of it? So I said the most important thing is to reach consensus. Reaching consensus reduces entropy, so therefore you have to dump the, uh, <coughs> extra entropy into your surrounding uh, environment. So proof of work <coughs> is exactly a mechanism compatible with this principle. We reach a consensus about the order of transactions, but in order to do that, there has to be a price you pay, and that's by burning electricity and dumping extra entropy or heat into the environment. So it is not somebody is doing some evil to it. It's a necessary condition for the natural world to reach consensus. <clears throat> so therefore, uh, to have a mechanism of decentralized consensus really give rise to a great uh, new uh, possibility. When you look at the history of the world, or more narrowly, into the history of the networking world, I can characterize the whole tendency of that history in terms of a oscillation between centralization and decentralization. Or in Chinese, we say it's 分久必合,合久必分. So in a long time ago, when I first came to the United States to study, AT&T was such a giant. It was a centralized platform enabled by one particular type of networking technology, which is called circuit switching. Under circuit switching, a centralized monopoly will operate the most efficient way. Therefore, uh, such a centralized giant has to emerge just through the forces of natural competition. But later, technology, one great technology gets invented. Uh, I'm sure Computer History Museum here must have documented uh, this uh, development, uh, which is the invention of TCP IP, which is a totally decentralized peer-to-peer -peer communication protocol. So just overnight, AT&T disappeared. I just couldn't understand that when I first came to the United States, at and it looked like it would last forever. But uh, overnight, uh, it uh, instantly disappeared. 
But then the information uh, uh, communication becomes peer-to-peer -peer and in such a decentralized way, the information got also very, very spread and become very disorganized. So therefore, centralized entities start to emerge again out of the next wave of from decentralization, first from centralization to decentralization through TCPIP, but now because of the widespread of disorganized information over the web, some need arises for centralized entity to emerge to organize this content better. And therefore, the platforms such as Google and Facebook start to emerge. They are not producing any information because after all, uh, this is produced by the web and by every one of us the users and the, the content providers, they're playing a role to organize uh, this information. So therefore, it became, uh, came into another phase of Fengju Bihe, uh, centralized entities start to emerge. So what is happening with the blockchain revolution is the next wave of decentralization. Because peer-to-peer -peer consensus became possible, unimaginable things will become possible. And I think, uh, and will make this daring prediction, that a lot of these giants centralized platforms that we think are invincible today will soon disappear. Uh, maybe not that soon, but in the, at least in the next 10 year uh, time frame. So this is the brave new world, and I have a slogan for this uh, brave new world. I call in math, we trust. Because when you think about the key about this new era of monetary economy, it's about consensus, I can ask you the question, among all branches of human knowledge, about which branch of human knowledge do we most have the most consensus about? This is certainly mathematics. When you look at these beautiful platonic solids on the left, you see that a mathematical cube is a perfect cube. We know exactly what it's meant. But a physical realization of a cube is imperfect in its way because you can never fashion a cube as perfect as a mathematical cube. So therefore, the idea of based on a new trust system and a new consensus system based on mathematics is the most natural thing we can think of. Because after all, at the most fundamental level, the deepest natural laws are formulated by the laws of mathematics. So on the back of the US dollar, you see the slogan of in God we trust. And finally, we can reach this era because math is the language of God. So what kind of math? So this is the thing that gets scientists very excited. And in today's world, I think the greatest opportunity is not for you to specialize in some one very particular direction in your particular branch of human knowledge, but the opportunities <clears throat> belong to those who can see it all and integrate a vast amount of human knowledge into one, uh, central, uh, into one uh, kind of uh, project or a uh, idea. So in this field, uh, mathematics uh, has advanced to a stage that uh, originally they appear to be very, very abstract in mathematical sense, but now they become central piece of uh, or, uh, monetary uh, or crypto economic science. And these are public key and private key encryption based on elliptic curves, cryptographic hash functions, zero knowledge proof and differential privacy, secure multi-party computation, formal verification, homomorphic encryption, and directed silico graph. So these are all maybe a little bit awkward sounding names for uh, from a common uh, <coughs> audience, but they are very, very deep because they can enable a new kind of economy of the crypto economy, which I would like to tell you about. So first of all, it will lead to a great integration of blockchain and AI. So you know, today's world, AI certainly is a very, very important uh, development. But in a way, the development of AI has stalled uh, for a little bit. And uh, it has stalled because uh, AI, what AI needs the most is data. But data is completely centralized in centralized platforms. So therefore, innovation cannot happen because maybe a university professor has a brilliant idea for a new algorithm, but he doesn't have the data to train his algorithm on. So this is the problem I'm seeing. But uh, <clears throat> with the blockchain and uh, crypto uh, economy and with the mathematics that I just uh, listed on the previous page, there's a new possibility of a data marketplace. So you have all heard about the news media, the tremendous problems that we have, that all data or user the data that should belong to us. And it is the greatest mine of all time. Now suddenly get leaked to all centralized platforms and we no longer own this data. So in the new world of crypto economics, uh, I imagine a world of data economy where every one of us own the data on our own device. 
And then, then you say, well, this is good. Uh, privacy will all value. But if everyone just keeps their data private, there's no way to reach some overall statistical insight. There's no way to train machine learning to get new insights. So this is the wonderful thing enabled by this kind of mathematics. In one word, what is making it possible is what is called the privacy-preserving computation. Through this kind of mathematics, even though the data is individually owned and the individual privacy is completely maintained, but the collective statistical information can still be obtained. So most of us would like to contribute to the collective learning and collective statistical insight as long as you don't compromise my own individual privacy. So if this kind of mathematics is possible, uh, this kind of technology is possible, then I can imagine a new world that every one of us keep our own information on our own device, and still collectively we can learn about the overall statistical property, but in the process of doing so, everyone else can also get rewarded. So that will kick in a new crypto economy, which will be much, much bigger than the internet itself. So I would rather estimate this will become internet times 10 or 100 in the future. So it also leads to a mechanism to correct a lot of the problems that we have in current society. The biggest problem we have in the current society is the discrimination of minorities. This is the most important uh, problem we uh, uh, face uh, in our society. Somehow society naturally evolved towards a tendency to discriminate minorities. But now let's imagine we have really such a data marketplace where each one of us own uh, our own data, and if somebody wants our data, they have to bid. Bid according to what principle? According to the market principle. How would market value this different kind of data? Imagine that I have developed an AI algorithm and I want to get smarter. I'm already 90% accurate. I will be 99% accurate. That kind of data I want is not another kind of data which is like what I have seen previously. I would like to study these corner cases so that I can train my AI algorithm to improve the accuracy from 90% to 99%. Therefore, what I will bid much higher are those corner case data. And these are, by definition, the minorities. So in this new world of crypto economy, minorities will be valued much more. So I call this world a world in which the ugly duckling becomes the beautiful swan. Because the ugly duckling is not ugly because it is simply different. But that difference is valued more. So I imagine that uh, crypto economy can do great to correct some of the problems we have in the current social system. I also imagine the AI and blockchain will work in symbiosis. Blockchain will provide data to AI, but AI can also uh, make the whole blockchain ecosystem a lot more compliant. So uh, may, now let me use the last few slides to tell you about uh, my uh, VC fund. As you heard from my uh, the previous introduction, uh, DHVC, I found it about uh, four years ago. We just rebranded recently. Uh, so in Chinese, it will still be called Danhua Ziben, and in English, it will be called Digital Horizon Venture. So basically, uh, our idea is based on the logo, which is, uh, first of all, a triangle, uh, meaning innovation based on education and, uh, and research. In Chinese, it will be called Cai Xue Yan. And we would like to build those bridges between the frontier of science and, uh, and into the world of the investment. So we made a number of uh, very exciting investments uh, in this field. Uh, maybe uh, the most important uh, and the most successful investment so far is ontology, uh, which only came to the market about uh, six months ago and uh, is the, one of the best performing projects in the last uh, six months. So it is exactly the idea of uh, enforcing a data economy and building an infrastructure for such a data uh, economy. So uh, what are the things we're thinking about? What we're thinking about is not about, uh, just about investment, because that is a little bit more passive. Other people come to you to pitch, and you try to judge what are the best projects. What we think is necessary in this field is that if we can really have an overarching view for the future of the crypto economy, we can actually reach all the commanding heights of the crypto economy. What are those components? For example, blockchain scaling is very, very important. We like to make the blockchain much faster, still based on something uh, like a proof of resources, such as a proof of work. So we're investing, uh, we're incubating projects which will make this DAG, directed acyclic graph, as a consensus protocol much more efficient. We invested in another alternative to proof of work called proof of space, uh, which is called Chia Networks. 
which uh, you don't need to uh, buy a lot of uh, uh, powerful CPUs, but if you have a lot of disk, you can mine or farm uh, for reaching these consensus. I think a very interesting idea is tokenizing network infrastructure. So very early on, we invested in a project called Theta, which is tokenized uh, content delivery network, tokenized CDN. But I think across all networking layer, because network, peer to peer networking is working because we're all helping each other. But uh, by tokenization, we can get better recognized and back, better incentivized uh, for these uh, network uh, forwarding and <coughs> contribution to the network. So one very, very important direction, and this is the project that I'm most excited about, is to have our own private, complete health information, private genomics data, private health data, and enable still a privacy-preserving data marketplace uh, to make it work. I also think stable token is very important. Right now, the token price fluctuates a lot. There's natural mechanisms uh, to, uh, to uh, have a stable token. And to also tokenized sharing economy, uh, also identity and credit management are extremely important. So one project right now we're involved in is called Vivo. Uh, and uh, uh, and <clears throat> so we basically want to build the entire infrastructure in which we all own our private uh, health data, such as the genomics, IoT, and uh, electronic medical record, keeping it completely private but still enabling privacy-preserving computation for it. So this way, different siloed databases will be unified because the central entity is myself, because all the data should be owned by myself, uh, but then a marketplace will take place. People can use these data to perform uh, uh, healthcare research uh, and improving the health, but if I'm contributing these data to the overall statistics without uh, compromising my own privacy, there will be tremendous incentive for everyone uh, to participate in this uh, marketplace. So uh, we're also hiring actively, try to work together to build this uh, vision. And uh, my colleague, Yule, maybe you can stand up. Uh, and uh, after I leave, uh, those of you who are interested in this project can uh, talk to her and send us your uh, resumes. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm coming to the last part uh, of my talk. Uh, so one of my favorite books uh, of all is Newton's Principia. So basically, he laid out a mathematical foundation for all the natural sciences. But what I think, uh, if this uh, new world of in math we trust is really upon us, uh, we're really getting into a very, very exciting world. I always thought that economics is not a real science because it's all based on human irrationalities. But by basing on mathematical principle with the crypto economy, we finally can reach into a new era of humanity where our rational economic behavior is much more based uh, and can be understood uh, in a very precise way because it's based on math. Thank you very much. Can we have the, uh, yes, you have to stay on the stage. Great talk. Uh -huh. Thank Archimedes, you. Newton. <laughs> um, we have a presentation because um, you're a very important person. And the reason you're important is you're leading thinking in a key area. And you uh, have been designated as a superstar investor of global disruptive innovation. Thank you. Thank and for you. that, you have yeah. something to put yeah, at sure. home and yeah. show your family. Shall we take a picture together, three of us? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We need a camera for that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Professor.